Welcome back to the studio. We're in conversation the next 30 minutes to discuss defending digital democracy. And this is a conversation that will include Anne-Marie Engtoff Larsen. She is the technology ambassador of Denmark and also Eileen Donahue at Stanford. Over to both of you. Thank you so much. My, well, good to see now the tech is working well. Good afternoon, uh, good morning. Good day to all of you. Thank you so much for tuning in and, and uh, thank you, Melissa. My name is Anne-Marie Larsen and it's my great pleasure to be here with um, my good friend and a strong defender of democracy in the digital age, Eileen Donahoe. Today, we will be talking about how authoritarians, those who do not believe in democracy are increasingly taking up the tools that we thought would bring us more democracy, new digital tools. They are taking them up and using them in their fight for um, limiting freedoms, for limiting human rights, for limiting democracies, whether it be surveillance in data uh, gathering, whether it's the use of disinformation or cyber attack. We have seen an intensity in increasing and solidifying power around digital technologies. That, I think, is a dark outlook. The positive outlook is also that governments, civil society, international organizations have increasingly um, raised to the fore and understand now that this is a fact about values. And if we are to uphold democracy in a digital age and expand it and make it more meaningful, inclusive, and transparency, we need to harness the moment of opportunity that we are in right now. So that's why I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, we will dive into uh, sort of two big segments. One is first looking at what is digital authoritarianism, what are the challenges around it, and then secondly, we'll look at the more positive side. What are some of the solutions? And, and hopefully, we'll see whether we leave this conversation as, as optimists or, or pessimists or maybe realists on behalf of the future. Um, I just want to say you can also ask uh, questions in the chat box. Please do so, and, and we'll, we'll take them as we go. But let me start, Eileen. Um, you know, digital authoritarianism, I know it's hard to do in 30 seconds, but, you know, in brief, why is it and why is it that we should care about it? So let me first say thank you for including me. I love having conversation with you. I always learn something new. So from my vantage point, I think we have to see digital authoritarianism as really a turbocharged version of authoritarian governance, um, where repressive governments are capitalizing on data and digital tools for surveillance, censorship, spread of disinformation, and basically to solidify state control. Um, I would note AI it, uh, has enabled a whole new level of digital repression and given authoritarians a previously unimaginable level of state control over the information realm, and also very concerningly new social engineering tools to shape citizen motivation and behaviors. Um, to your pointed question, why should we be concerned? We have to recognize this is not just a problem of repressive use of technology. The key point for everyone is to understand digital authoritarianism is really an alternative form of governance, an entire techno-social system that promises security and control for the state as opposed to liberty and security for individuals. So it is really antithetical to democracy and the original vision we had of an open internet. Um, and my concern, as we've discussed, is that it could become the dominant model of governance in the 21st century. That was indeed in 30 seconds. Thank you, Eileen. So, you know, as an alternative form of governance, we've seen that alternative form really winning on behalf of democracy. If we look at all the numbers, we're seeing, you know, a decline in digital rights, a decline in freedom online, a, a decline in human rights. We see a rise in people, individuals living in authoritarian regimes that rather than democracy. So on the statistical side, it looks like the numbers are against us. On the positive side, and a lot of the work I know both that you do at Stanford, your engagement in the Freedom Online Coalition and, and a number of other places, we're sort of, you know, seeing the baton being kicked up, you know, being taken up, this uh, renewed commitment to, you know, multi-stakeholder push for ensuring democracy in a digital age. So, you know, is this a moment of opportunity 
is this where things turn or is this the sort of moment that the, the point of no return of which we realize there's nothing to be done? So it's both, but I have to start on the negative side of the equation and just really emphasize that. And in part, because what we have seen uh, is an unconscious drift within democracies themselves in terms of utilization of data and technology in ways that are inconsistent with human rights commitments. And so many repressive practices have kind of been normalized around the world, like internet shutdowns or use of spyware and hacking tools against human rights defenders, lawyers, opposition figures. Um, there's also a lot of repressive cyber regulation and digital regulation again, inconsistent with the in international human rights law framework. So I, I have to emphasize there is an intentional aspect to this in the authoritarian world where there's an embrace of this entire model uh, to achieve repressive aims. But on the de democratic side, there, we also see pretty bad trends. On the positive side, there are a couple of indicators that the democratic world has woken up to some extent. And I will mention two, the first of which was the Denmark Tech for Democracy Summit, which was one of the most comprehensive, positive visions of how we can bring the democratic world together and utilize technology to support democracy and get our acts together in terms of a democratic approach to use and regulation of tech. And I will also mention the US Summit for Democracy, um, which was the Biden administration's big initiative, but the concern about digital authoritarianism was one of the big pillars, authoritarianism and then recognition that technology has become the vehicle for authoritarians to assert their control. So those two signals give me some optimism about the seriousness with which democratic governments are gonna take this threat. So let me, let me flip it back to you. Um, and let's shift our focus even more explicitly and further on the democratic side of the equation. And I wanna hear your assessment of how democratic governments have, a, have really responded, if at all, to the authoritarian model? Or do you see them kind of sleepwalking into a world where digital authoritarianism becomes the dominant model? Where are we from your vantage point, from where you sit in terms of advancing this democratic vision? I think we are at a pivotal moment in the sense that when I came, you know, came of age and grew up over the past two decades, uh, it was a period of renewed optimism that we would see more and more democracies thriving around the world. And it's sort of going from, from the end of history, but into this amazing time when, you know, Twitter uh, was a platform that would lead the Arab Spring, we would see more democracies in the Middle East. It was the Facebook would connect us to the entire world and uh, sort of across languages and cultures and um, different barriers, we would sort of be reunited in this beautiful digital way. Um, and I think in that sense, we did sleepwalk. We were looking at these technology companies as, as sort of modern saviors as opportunities for us to finally address the, the sort of the last strong men of the 20th century and ensure that democracy became the dominance. Well, the thing is that we were naive. I think we've been sleepwalking and we were somewhat naive in thinking that that would all happen by itself. Um, we were dependent on a technology that we didn't um, ask the right requirements to. We did not demand enough of that to be actually supporting democracy and looking at the long sort of long perspective. And I think more importantly, we saw that the same tools that can be liberating, they are phenomenal for suppression. They are phenomenal for suppressing your own, you know, your own people. And as you said, sort of an intentional approach that is inconsistent with human rights law and that fundamentally is focusing on other responsibilities rather than those of the citizens. So I think in short, yes, there has been sleepwalking or at least a naive approach to this. The good thing is that that is no longer the case. 
um, the amount of you know governments around the world, I think, that really took the Biden summit, as you mentioned, as a call to action for saying this is a time for us to do something differently. And most importantly, it's a time for us to do things not only abroad and far away, but look at home. Look at how the technologies that we are developing and using and integrating into our governments, using in our citizens, that is a backbone of our infrastructure and the ones that we are supporting other countries with, how are they actually becoming democracy affirmative? And how do they support the values that, you know, frankly, we've probably been taking a bit for granted? So um, staying with this theme of um, democracies waking up and the need for real democratic unity, if we're going to confront this threat, I want you to focus a little bit spe more specifically on what's going on in Europe um, and help us understand the different strands of thought in Europe with respect to digital technology more generally, and also with respect to the, the digital authoritarian threat by government. And I will note that the impression from the United States is that within Europe, the primary focus has been on reining in US big tech and a less focus on the digital authoritarian geopolitical threat. So do you think that's a fair assessment? And I will also say, you know, we could almost look at this pre invasion of Ukraine and post invasion of Ukraine, because there's been a dramatic shift in the in terms of democratic unity since then. But pre invasion of Ukraine, let's take where was Europe and how much have things changed? Let's, uh, I, I definitely agree with you. There's sort of February 24th sort of marks another, you know, there's a before and after. Looking at before, I absolutely agree. Like looking as a, you know, somewhat as an outsider sitting over here in Silicon Valley, Europe has been focusing largely on reigning in big tech. Um, some of the most, you know, significant pieces of legislation, I think, over the past 10 years, and some of the pieces of legislation that will really change um, um, how big, te big tech is operating has come the Digital Services Act, looking at online sort of content moderation, the Digital Markets Act, looking at antitrust measures, um, GDPR, uh, a lot of the work being done on AI now. That being said, I think it's because that was the immediate challenge that we knew how to tackle. We know how to do antitrust and how to maybe take the toolbox of the 20th century of antitrust and you know reconsider and, and reconfigure it for the for the 21st century. Um, content moderation, we've been discussing that for so long. So not to say that the, the process of the Digital Services Act was certainly uh, uh, not easy, <laughs> but we know the problem at hand when it comes to digital authoritarianism. It's much more abstract. It's um, some of the geopolitical implications are much more challenging. Um, and so going to a point, I think there was a before, you know, before February 24th, but with the invasion of Ukraine, I think we've seen sort of a new opening and saying, this is, this is not, this is not Europe against American tech. There's much more that unites and divides us. Um, yes, there are some critical, you know, societal implications of big tech. We need to address them. I think we're doing that adequately with DMA and DSA. But these technologies, they were founded in democratic countries. They operate within democratic jurisdictions. Um, we now have room for managing the downsides, but we still believe ultimately that they are part of the solution. You know, that's the reason why Denmark has a tech embassy in Silicon Valley. That's for engaging diplomatically with them because we don't think it's about banning their products and services. On the contrary, we think they're actually some of the reason for, for hope in this world. So, you know, just a, just a short point on, you know, after what happened, you know, on, on February 24th, Europe has been reunited. I think we've found out what is it worth fighting for? What are the European, I don't wanna say transatlantic ideals of human rights, of freedom, of democracy that we've been taking for granted. And all of a sudden there are boots on the ground and there are attacks in cyberspace that are not only threatening but directly attacking those values. And so now I think we're, about, yeah, I think we're a new moment also for technology companies um, to actually you know, work together on this threat and that's looking at digital authoritarianism. I think in that there's still a big question on on one of our one of the big countries to the east and and Eileen I know you've been super engaged in this question around China digital authoritarianism obviously right now a lot of our eyes are on Russia but I'll be curious you know where does we currently stand in regards to China on this Oh so you know we do have a lot to worry about when it comes to Russia and I think there has been uh, you know 
renewed understanding that the Russia threat never really went away. That said, in the digital context, to me, China really is the thousand pound gorilla that we're up against. And you know, my, my first point is we need to understand they have gigantic ambition to remake the international order according to authoritarian values and their vision of digital society. And they are working really proactively to spread their model of digital authoritarianism on multiple layers. You know, it starts just by showcasing how effective they can be at control with digital tools at home. And then they export and normalize those tools and practices abroad. Even more concerning in the export realm is that entire digital information infrastructure systems are being built and maintained in the developing world. And China is really gaining leverage over those weaker importing states for decades to come by virtue of importing that infrastructure. And they're also getting new, new sources of data. Um, but beyond the technology diffusion, there's also um, diffusion of ideas and norms. We see them flooding the zone of international diplomacy related to, to cybersecurity and digital policy, international standard organizations um, like the ITU, you know, where they are trying to shape interoperability protocols for the future. And that will have very big consequences if we do not wake up to those, those other points of leverage that they've got. And I'll also just mention, you know, besides the disinformation front and the surreptitious malign activity that goes on cross borders, we see really aggressive, what they call wolf warrior diplomacy, where they are openly using propaganda and their form of strategic communication to try to underscore their perception of democracy being a weaker form of governance. Um, last point, though, I really want to make to Democratic stakeholders on this is that China's international influence happening through all those layers really has started with massive investment in technology, R&D, uh, innovation. And um, they know, the CCP knows that power derives from technology in a digital world and that through technological superiority, they can gain military dominance, economic dominance, geopolitical dominance, and even have much bigger normative influence through the, through the fact that they have technological power. And so we can't afford to see technology as the problem. We have to remember it's about leading in technology and then leading in governance of technology with values-based frameworks. Maybe that's a great segue. I mean, leading in technology, leading in governance. Um, I think you pointed out very well, you know, Russia and what's happening right now might be the immediate challenge. But I think you really laid out what are some of the much more structural, substantial, systemic challenges in you know two, three, five, ten years from now. Let's go to the possible. Well, Let's go to the optimist's um, perspective on this. I know you have a sort of a quite elaborate framework for them. What is the solution? How do we tackle and address this? Um, maybe you want to share with us. Um, I think it's a five-point plan. <laughs> well, it was interesting having been part of your the Denmark summit. It really forced me to get very concrete and thinking, okay, what do we do about it? Um, I, I, I like to put things in frameworks and I tend to see this as at least a three level, three layer challenge, different kinds of issues. One is literally investment in technology to in, in, where there is both a defensive part and an offensive part. On the, on the defense, we, we need to protect our critical supply chains like semiconductors, um, we need to make sure that there's adequate export controls on semiconductor manufacturing equipment, which is if we hand that over, we are handing over an area where we have superiority. And there are certain critical technologies where we are right to protect and defend our advantage. 
But on the offensive side, when it comes to technology, we really need to invest dollars in research, development, talent, building skills, leading on horizon technologies, you know, furthering um, our advances in AI, looking at quantum computing, which really could be a game-changing technology. And we, you know, there is a theory that Quantum could be kind of winner take all if somebody gets a real leap ahead. So we can't afford not to uh, be superior in that category. And then I think there are other technologies where it, uh, um, the technology itself is supporting democracy, sort of privacy enhancing technologies so we can capitalize on data without giving up privacy um, and also my, my big pet peeve is we, you know, the need to focus on quantum resilient encryption. That is a technology that I would put at the top of the list. We must lead there because if we don't, if, if we don't figure out how to protect our encryption, encryption models and systems, once somebody has that power, we are, our sense of radical cyber insecurity will go on steroids. Um, so that's the tech layer. Underneath that, I think there is a, a the, the governance layer, tech governance that's got to be values-based, human rights-based. And there we need to do a much better job of articulating how would we demonstrate democratic human rights-based use and regulation of data and technology. There has been a lot of progress in that regard in Europe in particular. We need much more work. These two things have to go together, the, the tech superiority and the tech governance leadership. And then the last thing is if we want to lead globally, we can't retreat into sort of our own countries, our own digital sovereignty, or even just into the transatlantic alliance. We have to have the bigger tent around the globe. And so we have to invest much more in international diplomacy with respect to these norms, cyber norms, use of tech, digital policy, as I said earlier, international standard setting. We, we need um, to make sure the democratic world is bigger than the authoritarian world in digital society. Um, that's my grid. Um, I'm curious, we should go right to you on this exact front though, because Denmark has been the leader in getting people to focus on this affirmative vision, not just you know, wringing our hands and admiring the problem of digital authoritarianism or malign uses of tech. Tell me a little bit, tell us all a little bit about how is Denmark approaching the positive side of the equation? I think actually go into your layer two and layer three in the model. So first on the tech governance, recognizing, and it goes a little bit to the you know, what we discussed earlier about sort of a, a naive way of how tech been regulated and say, we, we can't do that anymore because that sort of assertion and diffusion of norms and ideas from, from our adversaries, we need to do the same. So it's much more thinking about what is a positive vision for where a world in which technology is increasing accountability increasing transparency, giving more people voice. It is supporting both on the innovation economic opportunity because that is a big part of this. It is a lever for national security, for protection of your citizens, as well as an opportunity for promoting human rights. And I think it's important to say there is not a trade-off between national security, economic opportunity and development and the promotion and securement of human rights, of fundamental values of liberties. On the contrary, we believe in, a, you know, as, 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 as strong Democrats in this space that democracy ultimately sets us free as individuals, but it also brings more opportunities. And that's the positive vision with the Tech for Democracy that we really put forward. The, the Copenhagen Tech for Democracy pledge is a, really for me, it serves as a, as a reminder for those of us in governments, for those people in civil society, for the tech companies about recommitting to the reason why we engage in this topic is because we have some fundamental beliefs about a world that could be better. And it's going back to some of the originals ideas of the people who invented the internet. You know, the, the early inventors of AI, the sci-fi writers who envisioned a world that was 
much kinder, much more meaningful, much more transparent, much more accountable, simply a better place to be in. And I think that is some of the fundamental values to your point. It's, it's values diplomacy, and that's just a question of interest. Two, on the Big Ten approach, we believe in the multi-stakeholder approach. Yes, there is a lot that has to be done through legislation, whether you know when it comes to facial recognition or spyware, we probably need to do have some proper legislation around it. But tackling disinformation, that is also about equipping our citizens. It's about digital literacy. Um, it's about working with the tech sector. When it comes to, um, I think you said it very well, sort of export controls and, and secure value chains, that's, that's diplomacy. We need to do that with other governments. We need to do that with the tech sector. We need to work with academics, with civil society. So that's attack for democracy, in, in, I think, in a nutshell. The second piece of attack for democracy is these action coalitions. Um, I love RightsCon because we meet here, you know, whether we, you know, from all sort of different backgrounds from all over the world. What do we do between the meetings? What do we do between the, the tech for democracy meeting, the RightsCon? How do we get into the dirty work together? And that's where the multi-stakeholder coalition. So both engaging much more with the Freedom Online Coalition, where so many of the people that are part of RightsCon is also taking part. Um, how do we engage on the UN agenda on these issues? So that's the other piece. And then the action coalition. So we have the action coalition on, on trustworthy information online that's working with um, tech companies and civil society and, and, and a number of governments and advancing more trustworthy information, particularly in jurisdictions and countries that do not speak English. Um, we're looking at the, at the sort of gender-based harassment online. We are practically keeping about half of the world's population out of meaningful engagement online. So just to say, these are some of the ways in which we're seeing an, an opportunity for engaging specifically in these issues. And it's taking both the sort of long-term mission, getting governments, companies, civil society, international organizations on board, the fundamental principles and what we're fighting for, the shaping of an inclusive narrative. And then it's doing the work and making sure that those words are actually translated into action. Um, and with, I know we only have a couple of, of minutes left and um, I mean, you and I could continue having this conversation because it is a rich and important one. Um, I love what you said about the technology. You know, how do we, you know, it's about winning the race for, for, for quantum secure encryption. It's also about the opportunity for using AI for what we really hope for, but, but maybe we can table that for another discussion. So maybe, Aline, if we end on the note, we promise to tell people where, whether we're optimist, pessimist, or realist on behalf of this. So maybe if you want to close, of off, close us off with just saying a little bit about what, what's, what's in store and should we leave this conversation and this rights con as optimist or pessimist? Well, one of the biggest opportunities that I see out there is this theme of digital inclusion, which... Uh, the chair, current chair of the FOC, Canada, is making a ginormous push on this even today, um, this entire campaign to get people to wake up to the value of digital inclusion and the multiple dimensions of digital inclusion. Um, as you said, it's like, you know, it's 40% of the world is not yet digitally connected and all it's going to do is exacerbate inequality. I believe export of information infrastructure is a way we contribute to connecting the world and spread our values, which are embedded in our technology. And that ironically is the best way for us to fight the spread of digital authoritarianism. So I'm very optimistic about the potential there. Well, and I, you know, I was born an optimist and despite all this sort of challenging things we see, I think this rights con is a great testimony to why we should remain optimist. Thank you so much for the conversation, Eileen. Um, to all of, yours, of you who joined in, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you can read more about the Tech for Democracy on the techfordemocracy.com. Um, we look forward to engaging with you. Thank you. An excellent conversation with the ambassador and Eileen at Stanford University. Big topics and echoing uh, some of the comments from Maria Reza, the journalist and Nobel Peace Prize winner from earlier a few hours ago, talking about the need for democracies to really think about technology's position in the 21st century and the relationship uh, to democracies in a way that, frankly, some authoritarian states are uh, well ahead on. Thank you so much for joining and speak to you later. Stay engaged.